Good afternoon, everyone, on a very wet and cold day. Thank you for coming along today. It's my absolute pleasure to um, welcome you to this exclusive session in partnership with The Guardian. I'm TIFF's Industry Director, and my name's Kathleen Drum, and we are just thrilled to have this collaboration with a publication that is famed for its courageous and authoritative journalism, and which attracts millions of daily readers, as it is, in, in fact, the second most popular English language news site in the world. Before I introduce our guests, a reminder, please, that no professional photography or video recording is allowed inside the studio. However, we are live streaming to our website and YouTube channel. So please feel free to tweet and post using the hashtags on the screen behind me to keep the conversation going with our online audience. We are delighted to welcome Mike Lee and Georgina Lowe this afternoon to talk about their new film, Peterloo, which tells of a, a warm August day in 1819 and what started as a peaceful gathering of unarmed town and country folk who came together to call for political reform and which descended into an infamous flashpoint and the bloodiest political clash in British history with nearly 20 people dead and 650 wounded. When I first suggested this film as the subject of an onstage interview to The Guardian, they were ecstatic. For not only did it cover a turning point in democracy portrayed by one of Britain's greatest contemporary filmmakers, but the event itself sparked the foundation of the Guardian newspaper by a young cotton merchant called John Edward Taylor who had written the first eyewitness account of Peterloo and who wanted to see a new paper committed to political change and truthful reporting. Mike Lee is a multi-award winning filmmaker who, has, who won Khan's top award, The Palm Door, for Secrets and Lies in 1996, and who has received seven Academy Award nominations. His remarkable filmography includes High Hopes, Life is Sweet, Topsy Turvy, Vera Drake, Happy Go Lucky, Another Year, and Mr. Turner. Producer Georgina Lowe worked with Mike Lee on Another Year in 2010, for which she was nominated for a BAFTA. She was also his producing partner on Mr. Turner and Peterloo. Her television credits include Tipping the Velvet, The Mayor of Casterbridge, Fingersmith, Kingdom, and Partners in Crime. Peterloo had its Toronto premiere earlier today, and you can catch it next on Wednesday the 12th at 9.15 p.m., at TIFF Bell Lightbox. The moderator of today's session is Gwilym Mumford, who is The Guardian's deputy television editor and who writes about film, TV, and wider popular culture for the newspaper. Just before I bring, I bring our guests out on stage, we're gonna play the trailer. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Gwilym Mumford, Georgina Lowe, and Mike Lee. Uh, welcome to both of you. Uh, I should probably point out that uh, we haven't had any uh, public screenings in Toronto yet for Peterloo. 
So maybe we'll keep the spoilers to a minimum, although there aren't terribly many spoilers because it's a historical event. It's, it's a historical event, of course, that is very familiar to a lot of people in the UK, but maybe not so familiar to some members of our audience. So first of all, I was wondering if you could kind of explain why it's such a significant point in modern British history. Well, I mean, the, the basic thing um, that the peaceful demonstration on August the 16th, 1819, was about primarily was that only 2% of the population had the vote. People were also demonstrating, not only for their democratic voice, but because the, their condition, the conditions of their lives was very tough. Um, that's it in a nutshell. Uh, you have to remember that 1819 was historically only a very short time after the French Revolution. The French Revolution sat in people's recent memory. And the thing about the French Revolution is that radical folk, such as um, initiated and uh, attended the, this huge rally in Manchester, were inspired by the French Revolution. But the authorities, the government, the royal family, the magistracy, the law, they were paranoid about the French Revolution. They were paranoid that there would be, as many people for a long time expected, there would be an English Revolution, only a short distance across the Channel. And those things are, we deal with in the film and they um, did inform and motivate the event from both sides. And of course what happened on that day is that, to cut a long story short, and to be brief about it, the paranoia of the authorities was such that um, unwarranted violence and, and uh, irresponsible chaos ha occurred and a lot of people were, some 700 people were injured, and probably, it's still not known exactly, somewhere between 15, 16, and 20 people were actually killed. Um, it's in, there are various interesting things about the event. Uh, it is generally regarded as a landmark, a landmark in British political history, in British labour history, British socialist history. Um, it did resonate throughout the 19th and into the 20th century with, as other movements like the Chartists and the Labour movement um, developed and grew and the clamour for suffrage and eventually including female suffrage, uh, of course, um, it grew. Um, one of the interesting things that about the event itself, and I speak as a native of Manchester, is that lots of us who grew up in the Manchester area, and I grew up very close to where it actually happened, um, and we discovered this when we were making the film, because there are people involved in the film, uh, particularly in front of the camera, performers, actors, who have quite a wide range in age. Many of us reported that we grew up really not knowing about the Peterloo Massacre at all. Now, interestingly enough, that's not always the case. Um, here in, in the audience is our executive producer, um, Gail Egan, who also grew up in the Manchester area. And she tells us that when she was a kid, her father used to take her around and show her the sights. I find it extraordinary that when we were at school, even closer to where it happened than where she grew up, that, for example, the primary school, the kids' school, never took us around and said, this happened here. But it is the case, and it's very interesting to reflect on, and we don't really know the answer to this, on why it should be that such a major and important event should have been, should be such a well-kept secret. However, it's no longer a secret it was, and it is generally, and indeed we are doing... <laughs> We've gone to some lengths, by, by the way, of making a film to, uh, to aid that cause. Um, but um, 
it, it is a major event. And once having decided, as we did, to make the film some four years or so ago, um, we, dis we found ourselves on a daily, almost on a daily basis saying, my goodness, isn't this, well, isn't this prescient? Isn't this relevant to now? On all kinds of levels. I mean, we couldn't have anticipated some of the more uh, preposterous things that have happened in the world and how some of the some manifestations of democracy uh, have pulled us off course. I mean, there's been a terrible democratic mistake in the United States of America. It's called, <laughs> in case you don't know what I mean, it's called Trump. <laughs> um, and there's been one in Britain, in case you don't know what I mean, it's called Brexit. Uh, and of course, seriously, there are really in many parts of the world, not least parts of Europe, serious issues about democracy and about people's voice. And not least the film that we've made, and this is important in terms of the historical context, I think, not least about the, the, the fact that some people just have needs that aren't listened to and some people are not listening because they've got their own self-interest to preserve. The, the gestation of this film, as you say, you, you, you've both been working on it for four years. How much of that was made up of, of research and how difficult was that research process given the, the scale of the event? Well, obviously, the, the film has involved colossal amounts of research. Um, but that's the joy of making historical period films. This is our... Really, it's our fourth period film. Um, principally, the other three of them are, have been this film, Topsy Turvy, which, as you know, was about the um, theatrical world of Gilbert and Sullivan in the 1880s, and Mr. Turner, which was about the greatest, one of the great painters of the world, uh, J.M.W. Turner. Um, our other period film was Vera Drake, which was a different sort of period. It was set in 1950, which I'm old enough to remember 1950 because I was seven in 1950. Um, so it was slightly, a slightly less esoteric sort of research, although there were things in the film that was about a backstreet abortionist, which were indeed needed to be researched. Um, all of the films involved massive research um, by everybody involved on both sides of the camera. I mean, we do work with very intelligent actors um, who always get, are always very much involved in research for their own characters and their own sections of the film. And also we work with, um, for example, on uh, Peter Lou and Mr. Turner. We've worked with a very brilliant historian called Jacqueline Riding, who... Um, uh, was actually an art historian, which is why she worked on Mr. Turner, and then came on and was the historian on this film, Peter Lou. And it's th that's important because you need somebody who is really good at research and can point you in the right direction and select things and, and do all that. So research has no end. I mean, uh, 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 there are... I, I'm sure that there are areas that it will be very difficult to research or would be far and away more esoteric obscure. But actually, think, say, take Peter Lou. We're talking about all kinds of extant material, which is in the British Library, the uh, National Archive, in, which is at Kew in London, um, and there are several important collections in the north of England, in Manchester, uh, where you can actually find I mean, all the newspapers of the period, all, lots of letters, lots of visual reference, you name it, there's stacks of stuff. Um, and it's just down to getting stuck into it and really reaching a point where you can begin to pretend to live and breathe the world that you're recreating and its issues. Were there, were there any particular things that either confounded or upended your expectations for either of you when you were doing your research? Well... It's a question with no... I mean, massive amount of things, really. Uh, I mean, it's endless. Um, I mean, 
you know, uh, I suppose I would have to say personally that um, because I, by my nature as a storyteller and I suppose as a person, I'm a, a, a really much a very um, concerned with people and the detail of people's lives. Detail is the thing. Minutiae, you know, uh, and, and I think that if you look at Peterloo, you know, it, it tells the story in broad sweeps of the big things that happen that it's about, but it also gets into detail uh, and texture of the nature of people's lives and, and how they lived and, um, and what the issues are. Over. Good and bad people. So the, the, the answer to your question isn't we found out we found this or that and it was remarkable, but it's all there, hopefully, in the film. Um, and it's all a function of, in the first place, of the research. But then, of course, it isn't a documentary. It is a, a dramatization. And it, my job is to distill out of all the actual material uh, a coherent and, and, but dramatic piece of storytelling. And therefore, you know, it, you know if, you, if anyone that sees the film and then goes off and reads about this whole area, Peterloo and all that... Uh, associated with it, um, you will suddenly go back to the film and say, hang on a minute, where's this? You left it out. This happened. This didn't happen once, like in the film. It happened three times and all that sort of thing. But that's because it's a film and you can't... If, it, if we actually literally made a film about literally everything that happened, it would be not only a quite a dull film, but it would be an extremely long film, even longer than it is. <laughs> so, um, but that's all about... The combination of research and solid grounding and then being imaginative with that. Not imaginative in a gratuitous and irrelevant way, but in a uh, grounded and uh, responsible way. But still, remembering that it is uh, a cinematic, dramatic entertainment as well as being a history lesson. Georgina, was there anything thrown up by your research that surprised you or confounded you? No, not so Yes, as Mike says, lots of stuff. But actually, I think what we were just trying to do is to um, to tell the story with the scale that I think it deserved. And I think that was sort of... Uh, it became clear that that was going to be the challenge, really, to sort of make sure we could show it in all its horror and, and the scale of what was going on and what went on. I think, I think an important thing about the film is that... Uh, it is Peter, about Peterloo and... Uh, and uh, that was the nickname that was invented by a journalist to call the event that was the massacre. Theoretically, you could make a film just on that day, just about what happened on that day. But I think it would be fairly meaningless, even if you did it at the length and uh, on the scale that we do it in, in the movie. Because quite a lot of the film, but all of the film up to that day is all about all sorts of people and things that um, f from various sides uh, were involved in things that led up to it. And unless you really get all that, what actually happens on the day is pretty meaningless, really. You have to know the context and you have to, as with any film or, or indeed any piece of work, you have to be able to... Uh, the um, you, in, you as reader or audience, uh, you have to have um, you have to be informed enough for the film to earn your understanding, so that you've got some way of of uh, negotiating your way around it. Uh, your your film features obviously uh, real life historical characters, but also some creations as well. How did you go about building those fictional characters? Well. Um, in a way, it's what I've just been saying, which is that um, you, first of all, have to be focusing on when it, the, world, the world you're dealing with. Once having done that, um, I mean, you, you, you don't make fictional characters. Let me, start, let, me, let me answer this from another angle. The films that I've made, of which there are a lot, um, which have been contemporary, where we invent characters, 
to, from scratch and build a story with them. Uh, our, it, it's a given that we understand the world of those characters because we're in that world. We're in the modern world. And this is the world we're dealing with. I mean, it may be that we have to research this or that to do with particular aspects of the character we're inventing. You know, um, the character's got a particular kind of job or back experience. But basically, it, it's a given fact, given condition, that here we are in the 20th or 21st century, and, you know, we're making up the people in the world we know. Now, if you're making up creating characters, or indeed even if you're fleshing out people that you can read about in books, which is the case with quite a lot of the characters in Peter Lou, um, and you're not in this world, then obviously what you've then got to do is to do exactly the sort of research that I've already referred to, so that you really get your head into and we really can start to understand the world that we're dealing with. And then you can constructively and responsibly start to create characters. But don't forget, you know, we're talking about the 19th century. We're talking about, um, I mean, the Peterloo Massacre in 1819 happened less than 100 years before my mother and father were born. So actually, it's, it's, and it's also, the 19th century is in our received recent memory. It's not in our actual memory, but it's in our received memory. And not only that, you know, you come and to uh, create a world in the 19th century. You know, many people involved, we've read our Dickens, and everybody else that wrote in the 19th century. It's all, you know, it's part of our culture. And it's all there, it's accessible. It's amazing what we, what we, what we forget we, is, in a sense, already, to some degree, laid down in our DNA. So it's not quite as um, obscure. I mean, you know, if I was to decide, eccentrically, to make a film set in the 9th century, as opposed to the 19th century. I think, you know, also researchable, but, you know, whereas in Peterloo, as in Topsy Turvy and Mr Turner, we were able to research thoroughly how people talked, what language they used, what they sounded like, and so on and so forth, it would be infinitely more difficult to, to, to really to do that with any accuracy in a 9th century film. I mean, we, could, we would come up with something, but that something would be far more of a concoction and, you know, we would not delude ourselves that we were repli accurately replicating what people were like a thousand years ago or so. So uh, that's merely to say that the 19th century isn't as uh, obscure. It's, it comes ready de-obscured, in a sense, to some degree. Well, what's, what's quite interesting what, watching the film is that given that it is, as you say, just 200 years ago, it looks in a way far older, because Manchester, you know, hadn't, the, the, the Industrial Revolution was ongoing, but it, it, it hadn't really taken hold. And there was a sense that this could have been, to me, it felt like it, it could have been a century older. Was that hard in trying to actually find locations that, that suited the age? You want to answer that? Georgina, that's a good question um, for you. Yeah, well, I mean, it took a thorough search, and we, uh, Manchester was a composite of a, a lot of different areas. Um, we went to sort of up north, Lancashire, Yorkshire, Chester, Lincoln, um, all over the place, cherry picking bits and pieces. But then for the actual St. Peter's Field uh, work, we um, found this place called Tilbury Fort um, in Essex, as it happens, but it was somewhere that we could lock off and have privately for a number of weeks. I mean, we actually were there for nine <laughs> um, in the end, uh, and we shot some other sequences as well as the main massacre story day. Um, so yeah, so it was, and and we built some thing, we built some streets within that as well. So that, which again was based on thorough research uh, of what was actually there at the time, because the maps exist, there are drawings, there are engravings, there are, you know, as Mike said, there's lots of reference that we could sort of tap into. I mean, it is interesting that um, in Manchester and indeed in London, at the beginning of the 20th century, that's to say in 1900, um, there was still a huge number of Tudor, half-timbered, you know, black-and-white buildings, all of which disappeared in the... Many, or most in London, virtually all of them disappeared 
in the 20th century. A lot of them in the early part of the 20th century. Even though, ironically, people were building mock Tudor houses out in the suburbs <laughs> in, in, at the same time. Um, in Manchester, nearly all of them went. Uh, there are still one or two famous ones. There's a famous pub in Manchester that, that's uh, still as old as that. But, but, but um, at the, as late as the end of the 19th century, it was still there. And that's something that we had to find, uh, which is why we've filmed some of it in, for example, in, uh, in Lincoln and some of it in Gainsborough, where there are still uh, more Tudor buildings. But uh, an interesting thing that you're also talking about is that Manchester, which we think of as a great industrial city, and it was very much being industrialised and had been by the end of the second decade of the 19th century. Nonetheless, it was, you know, still very much um, surrounded by rural areas. And it was very much, a lot of its characteristics, as with many places, was still really 18th century. Um, and that's something that we, again, we had to sort of find that balance, you know, and that, that element as well, really. This is, I think, unquestionably your biggest film to date uh, in, in terms of its scale, and uh, perhaps it was the most expensive film to make as well. What, what were the challenges of making a film on this, on this grand size? Crowds of, <laughs> crowds of 60,000 yeah. people. <laughs> um, yeah, three weeks of 500 people on site every day, at least. A um, lot of dinners. Yeah, a lot of dinners. Yes. <laughs> um, um, stunts, you know, horses. Here's the thing about it. You know, uh, th those are the obvious challenges. Mm -hmm the scale of it. And, you know, a, 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 a lot of the actual action of, uh, on the day is about not only scale, but a lot of things happening at once and, you know, violence and horses and all the rest of that. So far as I'm concerned, um, although we know that uh, I've made lots of films where you get a trio or a quartet of people arguing with each other on a st suburban... <laughs> A, a staircase in a suburban house or in a back garden or something um, or, or just two people in a bedroom talking or doing whatever they do in a bedroom um, in the end it's all the same really it's people doing what they do so whether there's one person or ten people or five hundred people you know as long as you approach it in a humane way and as long as you do what I do naturally and I've already referred to this here um, I, I mean I if I look at a football stadium full of 80, 90, 100,000 people whatever it is as far as I'm concerned that's 80,000, 100 individuals they may form a community but it's about individuals and what drove our decision making creative uh, choices in putting this film together was involved not being uh, phased by the fact that of the scale of the thing but by saying let's just take it steady and let's remember these are individuals and they need to be rendered as individuals and they need to be looked at as individuals. I mean in the big scene where, where the, of the massacre there are no bird's eye views, there are no aerial shots it's all down there so that you're in there experiencing what you would have experienced if you'd been there on the day. Um, it, it's, all the elements are, have been prepared carefully as individual elements so that you really get into the detail of people. So, you know, the fact that there may be a, a huge number of those elements or units of action or, or characters is simply a question of taking the time and the patience and the diligence and this, to actually get it together and bring them to life and make sure that they breathe in front of the camera in the way that, as far as I'm concerned, you would do even if there were only two or three people in the story, if that makes sense. The other thing that's important, and this is where Georgina's um, great role is as the sort of uh, presiding mummy of the proceedings, <laughs> <laughs> which is that, you know, Filmmaking, by its nature, is nothing if not a collaborative process. Mm. You know, p 
painters paint by themselves, novelists write novels by themselves, musicians either compose by themselves or small groups of them just do it with each other and nobody else and so on. Filmmaking is collaborative on a huge scale. And when it works, it's wonderful because everybody's pulling in the same direction, everyone's on the same page, and everyone shares the spirit and the intention of the, of the operation. And that is a characteristic of mm. what we do because we always make sure that we... And the people that come back time and time yeah, again and to do it with us. we nice yeah. people who are solid and creative and stuff. And also we're extremely nice people ourselves. <laughs> So it helps. No. Um, and, uh, the, and what I'm saying really applies to people on both sides of the camera, yeah. both creatives and technical people on this side of the camera and the actors on the other side of the camera. And, um, you know, the actors in this film, in Peterloo, um, all 100 and something 160. of um, them, they, they were all completely onto it. Yeah. They all got into the research and they were all really moved by what it was about and getting into it. And they all went off and came back with extraordinary things they've discovered. It was exciting, you know, and uh, rich. And it, uh, it's all there and it, on the screen, you know. So um, the challenge that you ask about, but it's the challenge not just of the scale of the thing or of trying to get a governor into a pint-sized pot and all of that type of aspect of it, but simply... The, the challenge of the subject matter and saying, can we do it justice? You know, can we really um, respect those people that were killed there by, you know, by making a decent film about it? And we've had a go. Before the um, the action towards the end of the film, there's 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 a lot of talk. It's it's really sort of energised talk though. These these great scenes in in back rooms of pubs with people vociferously debating uh, you know, the, the, the merits of sort of direct action versus uh, kind of trying to talk people around. W was that dialogue created by you or was that, uh, were they speeches that already existed that you managed to dig out from history? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of real stuff that people said, obviously edited and distilled down and you know, um, made it uh, digestible and palatable, but some of it's directly from what people said. You know, um, there are different aspects of the discussion, different nuances. Uh, you know, there are the middle class respectable radicals and then the working class hotheads who wanted to be more violent, you know. And then, of course, you've got the, the various opposition, you know, not least the magistrates. But all of those things are actually, uh, all of those elements uh, come from actual research and stuff. But... Added, and added to it, licensed, legitimate, uh, imaginative dramatisation. Um, one, of, one of the most sort of extraordinary figures in, in the film, I think, is uh, the Prince Regent played by Tim McInery. Uh, he seems too ludicrous to be real, almost, but I'm, uh, I'm assuming that from your research, that it, that's how he was. He was this that's sort of how he was. figure. Some people have said, oh, well, it's like a pantomime. He's wearing, why is he wearing makeup? Because he did wear makeup. You know, this is the this is the age of the Regency fop. This is the age of those those plays that were performed. You know, um, the, the, the when you see him, it's a spoiler, but when you see him at the end of the film with his mistress, Lady Coningham, our, our reference for that were the famous caricatures of uh, Gilray and Rowlandson and Cruikshank, which are very, very famous indeed. Um, uh, and you know. Um, there's nobody here in this room or nobody out there listening to what we're saying who doesn't know over-the-top ludicrous people in real life. And as far as the research seems to tell us, nobody was more over-the-top ludicrous than the Prince Regent who became George IV, although the paradox is he's the man who you know, rebuilt London and, rebuilt all those, and was responsible for all those Regency houses and streets and terraces. Um, and plainly had some kind of taste. But he was paranoid and, you know, profoundly reactionary. And also, the, um, he was the product of the most horrible childhood and the most horrible treatment by his father, King George III. Um, uh, uh, and uh, so, whilst I wouldn't offer that as a defence 
of his behavior in the context of Peterloo. Nevertheless, it explains uh, with the um, hindsight of, of modern psychology uh, why he was as screwed up as he actually <laughs> was. Some people on the other side and no angels themselves. Was it important to get that sense of light and shade? And that you know there are some people who are who are calling for violent insurrection, and and maybe we don't yes, want that. Yes, but but again, you know, I, I, I don't think. I mean, it's a matter of what you personally think about these things. I mean, they they are desperate, and they cannot see the logic. Of, for example, of, apart from anything else, they can't see the logic of uh, having a, a royal family. But then there are many of us in the 21st century whose Republican tendencies would tend to agree with that. You know. um, the, the battle itself is, is, is it's portrayed. Not a, very, I must stop you because this is the interesting thing. Sorry, battle, that's the, that's no, the no, wrong people word do, to talk completely. People do talk about it as a battle. And people, a lot of people have talked to me about... Um, did I look at other battles in other movies? And incidentally, I didn't, because I've seen lots of movies and they're there in my DNA, but I don't, I don't, we didn't reference things on purpose. But, but a battle in a, in, in a, in a war, uh, um, warfare context is uh, two opposing forces, with each with the equal possibility of winning, confronting each other. This was not a battle. It was disorganised chaos, and it was... Uh, you know, for all sorts of reasons which are there in the film to be seen, um, it, 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 things went off badly and at the wrong time and in a disorganised way and somebody who wasn't there in charge who ought to have been, who skived off somewhere and all of those things. So it, it's kind of uh, that it was a, a mess and it was a terrible mess um, was a function of human folly and stupidity and really... Uh, can't be described as a battle, more of well, it, more of more of a descent into irresponsible chaos. What is your question? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, let's let's read really the massacre. Yeah, um, w when it does happen, it is shown in in sort of horrifying clarity. But it's interesting; it doesn't seem particularly gory in the way that you've depicted it. Was that was that a conscious choice? No, it just happened that way. Really, <laughs> that's all I can say about that. Georgina, anything to add? No, I mean, it is quite brutal. I think it feels very... No, it uh, means there's not a lot of blood. Not a lot of blood. There, were, yeah, I mean, there are reasons for that, but we can't... But there were, I mean, actually, if you studied it frame by frame, there are tons of extras who've got lots of... Um, background artists got lots of blood on them and what have you, but... Um, there is a case to say there's not as much blood as there ought to be, really, but that's a matter of, matter of opinion. Mm. Fair enough. <laughs> um... You've talked about, uh, you've already talked about sort of Monday parallels. Um, when you were writing the film, this was, as you say, before Brexit and Trump, but there, there were things at the forefront, I'm sure, of your mind, but one of them must have been that sense of austerity in the UK. We've gone through eight years of it. Was that Absolutely. there? Absolutely. Yeah. No question. And, and how, how do you think, like, do you, do you feel that people will take from that that... You know, here's the thing. Um, I've never made a film and I've made 21 films, that s said, think this or think that. You know, I do make films where I finally invite you to go away and reflect and ponder and debate and argue about and care about what you've seen and experienced. Now, although this film is, without any question, in, the, in an obvious, basic sense, more overtly political because it's about political activity, than any film I've made, it still remains a film which is a reflection on a whole bunch of things, which invites you to reflect on that collection of preoccupations and things that matter to us now. A film will only mean anything to any audience, any film will only mean anything to any audience um, in terms of that audience's, that audience, that, uh, any member of that audience's own experience of life. You can't relate to anything in any, by any other set of criteria. You've only got your own world to measure things by, to experience things uh, by. And this film is no exception. So without dodging the question, because I'm not, it really does uh, 
resonate, I suggest, with a whole lot of aspects of modern life in terms of political activity, political systems, um, organization, um, the quality of people's lives, uh, the people who have, the people who have needs, the people who are in denial of other people's needs, the people whose heads are in the sand, the people who are prone to destroy rather than listen, and all of those things. Um, and so I, so it does resonate on a lot of levels, but I feel that the, it, it's for the audience to go away and reflect on things as a result of the film, um, rather than for me or anybody else to uh, diffuse the experience of watching the film by um, being too specific or too black and white, or in fact, if you like, too simplistic about what it's about. You've, you've called for Peter Lou to be taught on the national curriculum in, now, in the UK. Now, let me just interrupt you there. <laughs> Your very respectable newspaper, which I read every day and have read all my life, nevertheless did interview me on this, and I did say that I thought that the subject of Peter Lou should be taught in schools. The headline of that piece said, Mike Lee thinks that... <laughs> Peter Lewis should be taught on the national curriculum. I did not say that because I don't believe in a national curriculum. I think cur national curricula are a very bad thing. I think schools and education should be much more freely uh, chosen and taught. So I just wanted to correct that as I have this incredibly universal forum to do so. <laughs> Correction um, noted. <laughs> uh, and, um, but yes, of course, I, I, it sh should indeed be taught taught in schools, and, as, and, and I said earlier, you know, I, I grew up not knowing about it, and uh, that's extraordinary, really. Um, I think all sorts of things should be taught about in schools. This is certainly one of them. And, and I, I take it you hope that your film would, would be part of that sort of education? Well, I, I would hope that uh, lots of kids will go and see the film, but I'd, we don't, it's the film is not designed to be shown in the classroom. I'd rather see it in a cinema. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you, you've now made two historical films in succession, both of you, um, with Mr. Turner directly before. Uh, is, this, is, is this a fertile area for you at the moment, sort of delving into the past, or, are you, or do you plan to make more contemporary works in this the future? This is a question which we're not disposed to answer, because um, whatever I'm going to do next is a secret. So and there, not, will, there will be not, another one. Another not film. even in, yeah. in the close confines of this universal conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Am I going to? No, it's a question. But, but, but no, we've made those films, and those are some films, but we're not, we're not, there's no, no fixed principle one way or the other. Um, let's open the questions up to the audience. Does anyone have a question? Someone in the front row here? Hello, uh, my name is Oscar Burka, and I just wanted to know, what was your approach with the camera for telling the story? What was your philosophy, how you wanted to shoot the film as a director? Um, well, as I mentioned a little while ago, for example, um, we didn't see, it didn't seem appropriate to, it felt wrong, it would have felt wrong, to look at the event, the big event, in a distant perspective. You want to be in there with the people. Uh, the cinematographer, Dick Pope, who I've worked with since 1990 on all of my films, um, and I, we sh very much share uh, a, a, an aesthetic and indeed an attitude to what we film. And this film is no exception in that it's all about shooting in such a way as, as unobtrusive and where what's happening motivates what the camera does so that you don't use the camera in a gratuitous or self-conscious or um, superfluously fancy way uh, that gets in the way uh, that, that stands between you, the audience, and the event. Um, Whereas with Mr. Turner, the previous film we made about the great painter, 
Turner, J.L.W. Turner, um, where it was important in the most obvious way that the film, the actual look of the film, should be very much informed by Turner's, a sense of Turner's palette, the look of Turner's paintings. With this film, of course, we looked at lots of visual reference, uh, and this involves not only the cinematography, but the design as well of this film. But um, we didn't really uh, work from specific uh, painters or anything of that sort, because the important thing, and again, I've alluded to this already, was to see it, although it is a historical film, and it did have to look period in the sense that it had to be plausibly, believably happening 200 years ago in all its texture and detail. Nevertheless, it's about people who are going to live now in this moment when you actually see them. And so the way of shooting it is very much uh, to serve that. Any more questions? Anyone in the audience? A lady there on the fourth row? Mike, Georgina, lovely to have you here in person at TIFF. Um, I know that traditionally a lot of your films, Mike, have uh, been uh, improvised as far as the script goes, and I wonder what your process with the actors was in this particular uh, work in Peterloo. Well, uh, um, as you know, but I'll just clarify it for anybody that doesn't understand what you're referring to, that um, all of my films... Um, that, that what you call the script, which is to say what happens, uh, comes out of a lot of preparatory work with the actors and uh, out of a lot of improvisation, but of course it's then, through rehearsal, pinned down and very tightly scripted, if you want to use that word, so that what goes, happens in front of the camera is very precise. This film is no exception. It's exactly the same, the only difference being that obviously when you're actually uh, doing a period film, and I've already referred to this, you've got to be sure that you are taking on board additional considerations like how people actually talk and what language they used and all of, and what their precepts and uh, points of, you know, their life references are and sense of things. But also, um, when we are doing a film like this where there are, we're actually assimilating into the film actual speeches such as Willem's referred to, that people actually spoke in public gatherings and so forth, um, actual quotes, uh, that's simply part, just a, a, an added la layer of the job, an added layer of sophistication, if you like. But basically, this film was made exactly the same way, in the context of your question, as all my other 20 films. Yes, I mean, it's about working with the actors very carefully and uh, slowly and building up all the characters and each, each individual character and putting them together and exploring. So that what, when you get to the film, you've got um, solid relationships and solid characterizations and uh, precise decisions have been made and, and the acting is relaxed and uh, the characterizations are three-dimensional and rich. Any more questions at all? Well, let's speak about the, a couple of uh, the, the performances. Uh, Maxine Peake is, is excellent, of course. And I think I'm right in saying that she, um, obviously being from Manchester, has a, has a particular relationship with Pisley Massacre. She, she performed The Mask of Anarchy, Percy Shelley's poem about, about it. Did she bring a lot to the table when it came to her performance? She did. Um, she did, I have to say, Probably what your question means is, did she bring a lot of knowledge about the P.T. Lewis massacre to the table? Uh, she, I mean, she she's has that knowledge. I mean, she has for a number of years, on the anniversary of the P.T. Lewis massacre, stood up, as you say, in Manchester and recited Shelley's poem, The Mask of Anarchy, which was inspired by the P.T. Lewis massacre. And she's very much part of a campaign to get a proper memorial to that and so on. But she, in playing her part, she didn't, I mean, she didn't sort of 
spend the whole time tub thumping and telling us all about it because uh, she, she, her job was to get on with it and play this woman who actually, interestingly enough, is one of the doubters uh, and, uh, you know, questions things. Um, I think if Maxine Peake was the kind of actor who had an, a sort of an agenda and couldn't shut up about it, I wouldn't have had her in the film. <laughs> but she's very much not that sort of person. But what she did bring to it, as indeed did a whole lot of the actors, was a, a real, you know, she's from the Northwest. She still, although she went to Raja, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, she still doesn't talk with her, she still talks with her own accent, re regional accent. She's, and she's very articulate and, and, and um, uh, knowledgeable about all sorts of things. But um, she, she also has a, she still lives it in the north. She has a sense of that. So she brings that to the table, and that's that was a really valuable thing. You know, it's a kind of um, it's a, an indefinable, indefinable quality which is impor important. And also, you know, w w we've enjoyed ourselves. Of, there's a certain amount of very obscure working class regional period dialect involved, um, which is great, you know, to hear. Um, I mean, some of it I remember hearing as a kid when I was growing up in the area. Um, you know, expressions like give over mithering, which means stop making a fuss. And um, at one point she uses the word stop scriking, S-K-R-I-K-I-N-G, meaning don't stop crying, you know. Um, that sort of stuff, you know, we got into, and she's good at that, you know, so she brought that to the table. Um, on the other side of the sort of north-south divide, there, divide, there's Rory Kinnear playing, I think, it, is his name Henry Hunt? Henry, Henry, Henry Hunt. Hunt, yeah. Known as Orator Hunt. Yes. Can you tell, me, tell us a little bit, bit about the real-life character? He's an extraordinary sort of white-hatted... Well, he, well, you know, this guy, you, know, you read about him, and we, all we did is we researched him and then tried to breathe life into what we found out. I mean, this guy was, was apparently a great orator, a great, had a great loud voice, and although, you know, there's a certain thing about speeches and loud voices that we constantly have to remind ourselves of. You know, the famous thing is people, there's an, famous images of Lincoln at Gettysburg making his famous speech to hundreds of people listening. Well, only about 100 people could have heard him because even Lincoln couldn't project his voice. Well, Hunt was very good at projecting up to a point, you know. Um, he was uh, uh, wealthy. Uh, he embraced the radical cause. Uh, uh, and uh, f f fought for it in the sense that he addressed many meetings and uh, he, he was apparently, it would seem, profoundly egocentric and arrogant and uh, disdainful of uh, the lower orders um, to a disgusting degree. And all of that's there in what Rory Kinnear rather brilliantly uh, portrays, you know. It's notable uh, that when, when, when you look at the, the sort of snobbishness from, from him and from, from, all, from all the establishment figures towards the North, it's kind of remarkable how that has kind of maintained over two centuries. Yes, I, it's a, it's, I, I agree, of course, but on the other hand, it's, it's a different thing. I mean, you know, at the beginning of the film, you discover, and this is historically totally accurate, that Lord Sidmouth... The Home Secretary, I mean, it, it, it doesn't state that it is a fact that, of course, he never went up north. So to him, the north, the northwest, Manchester, and he talks about this in the opening, one of the opening scenes of the film, it's a kind of horrible, remote, other planet where all this disgusting, sed seditious activity is going on. Um, now, it would be, I think... Uh, a little bit inadequate and probably disingenuous to say, well, that still happens. Of course, it, it's very much, it's there. But because of the, because of the media and the movement and the difference culturally in 200 years later, it's not quite as black and white as that, you know. But um, it's very much still, I mean, you know, you can certainly... Uh, if you, um, well, I, I've often thought it would be interesting to take, I mean, you could, in a very short time, um, go from very, very 
impoverished part of the east end of London to Chelsea and Kensington in one helicopter ride, or indeed, uh, it wouldn't take very long by other means of propulsion, to see two diametrically different worlds. And certainly, uh, I mean, I remember taking my, my son, who is now 40, but when he was probably about um, 10 or 11 or something, we were in Liverpool uh, visiting relations, and um, we had to go to a, quickly to find something in a greengrocer's shop. And we went, took the car, and we went somewhere near, and even though we lived in a not particularly posh part of North London at that time, um, he was astonished at the poverty that he saw and the emptiness of the shops and things. And I've always thought about that moment, you know, just sort of rem it reminded me of, of that divide that does still exist. And of course, we know, apart from anything else, we're in the age of the food bank in the UK, and that reminds us that what you're saying is true. It's, not, it's mostly a regional thing, but not exclusively so. It's a class thing. You, you mentioned media there. It, it, Peter, Peterloo was an extremely important event in terms of the formation of the, the modern British media. Could you talk a little about that? Yes, I mean, what, what we deal with in the film is the fact, is the press. I mean, what we see is the, is the what at that time was the, the radical newspaper that was... Um, um, promoting radical causes, obviously. Um, uh, what I find, apart from anything else, I found uh, remarkable about the newspapers of the period, and this is really, in a way, the er early modern press, is you look at the papers now, they're all available, there are copies around that you can see. It's amazing the detail and length at which things were reported. The number of uh, copies that they would print and the speed with which they had those out on the street, given that you could only print one page at a time. And, you know, so it's kind of, kind of, kind of still a, as you see in the film, that we show that. Um, uh, uh, it's just amazing that the, 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 the early version of that industry, long before big machines printed things, um, and way long before the way it's done now, which is, of course, very sophisticated. Uh, so it, I find that v v very interesting. And, of course, we know, uh, that has already been mentioned, the Guardian, the Manchester Guardian, as it was called, really was founded on the back of Peterloo. Um, and, uh, of course, evolved into the Guardian sometime, I think... Um, in the 1960s or yes, 70s. I think early 60s. I think that's everything. So thank you so much to both Mike and Georgina for, for speaking to us. And please go and see Peter Lou. Uh, enjoy the rest thank of your you. day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. I do want to.